thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you all for staying for the last talk. Uh, so today I plan to talk to you about something related to bulk reconstructions and specifically ex explicit reconstructions in, in, in the context of ADS CFT. So uh, this is work in progress with Celia and Brian and Eugene. Uh, so Eugene is a grad student at Caltech. Uh, so to start, let's uh, begin with some warm-up questions. First one is why should we care about what you're talking about? Uh, so bulk reconstruction is one of these things we really like to understand in the context of quantum gravity and, and emergent space-time. Um, even in ads -COT, let's say you have a boundary theory, you, you, you can um, uh, compute or even measure a bunch of entanglement entropies, but in the end, you would really like to be able to turn these entanglement entropies through the holographic dictionary into something in the bulk. So uh, that includes things like metric tensors or uh, curvature in, in the bulk, so it allows you to study bulk local dynamics more, efficient, more effectively. So this is coming from the quantum gravity side, but on, from the quantum information side, uh, the geometry com coming from this bulk dual is giving you a uh, representation of quantum information. Uh, and in some sense, gravitational physics also call also a form of understanding of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, such as the chaos and scrambling. So what do we know so far about this whole bulk reconstruction uh, thing that I'm talking about? Well, we will see in a little bit, but there is a number of dictionaries that exist which relates quantum information to uh, some quality that's geometric. And using these dictionaries, we're able to uh, perhaps say something about whether the state is geometric or not, or whether you can recover geometry from the information. Um, we sort of know that not all states are geometric. In fact, we know that geometric states are supposed to be very special. Um, and there are some very limited results on explicit reconstruction. So there is a lot of discussions on what kind of a program or what sorts of framework that we could use to apply to get these metrics. But here, this talk is about strapping, out, uh, strapping down and, and actually getting our hands dirty and getting those uh, reconstruction explicitly. Uh, there are also some uniqueness results, uh, which are um, somewhat recent, that allows us to uh, uh, talk about space-time uh, geometries. So, uh, so for this talk, I'm going to ex uh, exclusively fo uh, focus on entanglement reconstruction. So I'm going to use the so-called Yutagenagi or HRT formula the covariant version of it uh, fairly extensively. Um, I think most of us are fairly familiar with this concept. Basically, if I have a holographic duality, I have a theory of a formal field theory that sort of uh, looks like a lower, a lower dimensional surface in this diagram. And um, you can compute the entanglement entropy uh, between a subregion A, let's say, and this complement. And the uh, Yu Takenagi uh, formula says that uh, this entanglement entropy is proportional to the minimal surface area of the surface that's uh, anchored on the boundary of A. And in the covariant version, this is extended to an extremal surface area. So we're, as I said, we're just going to use entanglement data to reconstruct geometry in this case. So let's suppose that you're given uh, various kinds of entanglement, entanglement data. Let's say you can compute the entanglement entropies for all subregions A on the boundary theory. We would like to use this data, uh, somehow analyze it, and get the bulk geometry. And uh, applying an HRT or RT formula, it just says that instead of talking about just entanglement entropies, we're actually talking about minimal areas, minimal surface areas that are anchored to the boundary. And knowing all these geometric data, uh, we would like to discover something about the bulk geometry. So this is purely a geometric problem at this point. So, uh, so in this talk, uh, there are two major questions I would like to address. We won't really uh, answer them fully, uh, as all of these are really big questions. Uh, 
but we will see that uh, some of these uh, progress will go into answering uh, part of these questions. Uh, so the first one is how do we know if the boundary data that I, I extracted from the conformal theory actually correspond to the geometry? Uh, there are many different approaches. Uh, so uh, holographic entropy cone is, is one of the uh, things that so we can talk about. Uh, what are some of the constraints, for, for example, that uh, states that our geometric will have to fall, right? So there are a set of inequalities on entanglement entropies that they follow. Um, there's also things that you can say from, say, causal structures or from singularities of different scattering amplitudes uh, that you can compute on the boundary. Uh, these Lycom approaches uh, allows you to detect whether the, the bulk has a consistent geometry or not. There are various other uh, motivations coming from field theory as well that uh, they uh, deals with whether a theory is holographic. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is also a mathematical community that's approaching from sort of the opposite direction. They say we don't care about physics. In fact, they never knew about the CFT until quite recently. Um, so what they're asking is we have a set of uh, transforms, which are the things that we're going to use for this talk. Basically, this is a shut up and calculate approach, and it's to say that let's just apply these reconstruction formula to the data that we have. If somehow the, uh, there is inconsistency, that there is a set of uh, so-called moments conditions that you can check. So if boundary data satisfy these conditions, it will turn. Then the, there will be a unique bulk geometry. If there isn't, um, then well, the reconstruction fails, and you cannot say anything meaningfully about the bulk. So this is from the mathematical approach. Um, a question. Yes. So. Uh, you are going to, you're only going to use the entropy data on the boundary. Uh, so, so certainly if there existed a, a geometric bulk dual, um, I guess it, it, it better be possible to find one that uses all of those data, but it's not sufficient, right? I mean, it's not sufficient. Yeah, yeah that's, right. Right. that's right. We're going to, uh, yeah. So um, the second question we'd like to answer in this talk is, assuming the geometry does exist, how do you find it? Right. So, uh, these are, uh, so again, coming from the physics side and the SCOT side, um, uh, there are very uh, explicit programs that have been proposed how we can find uh, the metric exactly uh, from boundary data. Uh, some of them re require a high degree of symmetry, so if things are spherically symmetric, it's typically a lot easier to pin down what the metric is. Uh, there's also things coming from differential entropy, uh, at least uh, as far as I understood, the claim is that the program applies more generally, but the examples that it work on are uh, closer to the US. Um, so uh, again, then, to see the parallel on the mathematical side, uh, related to these uh, so-called met uh, methods of radon transform, there's a lot of uh, rigidity results, which is to say that um, uh, given a bunch of other data, I have a boundary minimal surface areas or boundary geodesic length is a consistent with a unique bulk geometry. So this is an extensive number of theorems being proven in this context. Uh, more recently, uh, we're also be, uh, we're also able to extend some previous results uh, from from mathematical literature to uh, dynamical space times. So if you know the extremal surface areas of, of these HRT surfaces, or uh, it turns out that uh, entanglement variations of entanglement data will allow you to construct a uh, space-time metric uniquely uh, in the uh, asymptotic ADS uh, geometry. So, uh, for this talk, we're not going to focus on the second approach. Um, we're going to focus on this first approach uh, using radon transform because it's been extended really well studied in all of the uh, uh, medical physics, applied math, the community, and is computationally uh, kind of very inexpensive to implement. Uh, so just to briefly summarize, uh, I guess, uh, preempt uh, the, the things we're going to talk about. To answer the first, uh, to answer the first question, do we know there is a, how do we know there is a geometry? Um, it turns out that the radon transform is going to provide a set of constraints. So if you are uh, 
if it is difficult to satisfy this constraint using boundary data, then we're going to say that its state is like the non-geometric. Um, and uh, in some cases, the constraint, these set of constraints are satisfied pretty well, then uh, we, we take a best fit solution and call it the emergent geometry. So that's how we will reconstruct the metric expression. Do you have a good classification of the potential failure modes and what are they all kind of treated for uh, We will probably, it's probably more clear if the go over to the example there. Yeah. So, um, I talk a lot about generalities and uh, some big ideas, so now I would like to make contact. Uh, how do we use radon transform to recover things like geometry? Well, we sort of know from before that uh, if I have a ground state of uh, CFT, it is dual to some empty ADS geometry, and if I just take some static time slice, it's precisely the, the whole, uh, of the uh, hyperbolic space. So in this uh, diagram, you can see that it is a negatively curved space, and each angel and demon is supposed to be at the same size. So as you go closer to the boundary, the angels and demons get smaller. But it's actually infinite, uh, infinitely large space. It has this metric. That's why I'm cutting in a geodesic that's uh, anchored on the boundary is shorter and it cuts through the bulk than a jet just going along the boundaries. Right. So what we learn from uh, the Yutagi Anagi formula is that if I compute the entanglement entropy of the region A, and the entanglement entropy uh, in this case is supposed to be proportional to the length of this GUD. Okay, so assuming I, uh, RT formula to leaving water, we'll be able to compute uh, essentially all of the length of geodesics. And it turns out that there is a math result that tells us if you have the sets of these geodesic lengths, uh, that's consistent with the hyperbolic geometry, this geometry must be used. So we can pin down vacuum ADS <laughs> fairly confidently, but that's not very interesting because the vacuum, uh, the pure ADS geometry is basically completely fixed by symmetries. We would like to go away from the highly symmetric state by, for example, adding some interesting acceptations. So if you were to go away from the vacuum uh, by adding some state, chances are you're also going to change entanglement attributes of certain intervals. And by RT formula, that means that the, some of the, uh, the, the geodesic lengths are going to change, uh, even if they're anchored at the same two points. Yes. So well, you're, you're considering a superposition of the vacuum and some other state of clears. Am I supposed to think of the of this other state of the small perturbation in the sense of, I mean, what are, the, are there any pre factors in, in that superposition? That uh, it, they're equally weighted. Uh, they're, it's supposed to be small. So there's like an epsilon. In front it's, of it's, it's it's a yeah. But and, and this and this uh, this new state, uh, but that new state could be anything. I mean, in terms, of, are you superposing different geometries here, or we could yeah. uh, later on we'll see. Not necessarily superposition, but something like that. No, I think he's asking the notation plus nine. Ah, the so same superposition of the and something else. Yeah, I just mean or that you change the state. It's a, it's a changed state. Yeah, it's just a low energy excited state. Yes. Over up, over up of this and the vacuum is zero. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. The so notation is not right. written here. Yeah, yeah. Notation is not right. Okay. What's written here is a superposition of the actual vacuum state with some other state. With some other state. This other state is just some arbitrary state. It's not normal. But, but it is a superposition. It is, it is a superposition. Sure. It is a superposition, yeah. yeah so yeah. this is. For instance, this is the ground state. This could be the first uh, some excited state with some energy distribution. But 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 then the overlap with the vacuum state is large, almost. Yeah, yeah 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 okay yeah, okay yeah okay <laughs> yeah sorry. that is it right okay yeah. and you're taking into account if this is not a completely different metric this side you take the idea is that we're taking into account the vacuum reaction somehow. Oh uh, uh, we don't take into the vacuum reaction. Yeah. But then geometry is what are you so how are you going to get a geometry different from the ground state? Yeah, good. So uh, it's it's uh, it's a back reaction of sorts, right? So we're only gonna take it to the linear uh, to the linear. Order. But but then our usual state is completely also one on the level of uh, semi classical geometry. Geometry is different, and then uh, I mean it doesn't really matter. I'm taking a, a, a I'm taking a different state here, so you can plug in the state and then look at what what happens. Yeah, but we're probably talking about just really like these expressions, right? 
Awesome. If you if you take a state that has a completely different metric for psi, then it doesn't make sense, right, to write the metric yeah. as as the original one plus a different one. It's just a quantum superposition of two different metrics. I, I completely agree with you. So if but if you don't do that, then then you need to tell me what you're doing to get this H I J. I guess maybe you were going to do that. I, I think when we go through the talk, we're going to see like if it this is a if you do something non geometric like like the case that you mentioned, uh, you're going to find out that the, the procedure uh, that you're trying to do to recover the HIJ fails horribly. Okay. So it, it is actually a diagnostic for you to figure out whether this superposition uh, of ge uh, geometry is where the superposition states actually is geometrically. Is that, is that the only application you have in mind, or is there also some regime where you have a well defined HIJ? There is, there is some so regime. So, how do you find that? Uh, How do you know what to expect for HIJ given the appropriate sign? Uh, I think I think we should just uh, maybe go over the actual formulas. I think it will become more concrete and easier to see what happens. Uh, so here is actually assuming the following: the assumption need not to be true, and we will see that if, when it's not true, a, a series of things happen that will lead to a bunch of other results. So, so here, in geometry changes, which means like if I were to go along the same curve, so remember I fixed the background, we have a lot. Uh, so all the, ge all, all the geodes that are fixed. So if entanglement is fixed, uh, sorry, if entanglement changes in this interval, now if I traverse, and uh, sorry, if the background, sorry, if the bulk geometry also changes, now if I traverse through the same curve, that curve is going to have different length than the one that I had before. It had the background secure on the bottom. So I'm going to interpret that deviation as HIJ. And uh, in the case where such consistent definition of HIJ does exist, it is given by a Riemann transform. So uh, the length difference, which is interpreted by the entropy difference, is cap captured to the in order by the Riemann transform of the metric perturbation HIJ along the ten that's projected along the tending vector uh, of the G limit. So it seems like a no-brainer. It says that if, uh, now I, all I have to do is just import the radon transform, right? Then, then I should be able to get back HIJ. Uh, but, but then the state is probably all orthogonal seems to be. I mean, eh? because you, you're doing the reading over one of n, right? And then if you change the entropy, it changes geometry. Mm -hmm. So the classical geometry is stable yeah. at this point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. usually those states are uh, not like almost overlapping. It's not like that, right? It's not like zero plus some small perturbation. Of course, yeah, the change of geometry is small, but it's completely different. Yeah, yeah, but but since from the previous slide, I actually I just don't care what that change of state actually is. Oh, yeah, it's it's I can I can written I can write it as it becomes a project one part into the vacuum and the leftover pieces is written as that or something. I mean there should be at least examples where I, I understand what I should have expected for there exist examples where the non-trivial geometric perturbation should be somewhere I should have been able to figure that out without looking at the length of geodesics just because I know what superposition of states I can see. So for example, yeah. I mean I guess I I could consider a state and just and just compute the expectation value of the stress tensor for it and then solve Einstein's equations. But I think you're saying that's not what you're saying. Uh, so then I don't understand How to interpret the HIJ at all? Because, yeah. No, this. What, what is this metric of solution to? This is this. Okay, so right now we have a set of things that are being changed. We don't really know if they actually correspond to a metric. Here is to assume that if there is a metric that if that generated these independent piece changes, we will be able to back out the metric. If not, then we won't be able to back out the metric, and we will see. Isn't it obvious from the start that if you are an equally back reaction and you're considering small part ranges of the vacuum, I just don't understand how I'm supposed to get anything that's not back the vacuum metric. Mm -hmm. or, or if I superimpose it with something that's a totally different metric to start with, that I obviously then shouldn't be a solution. Maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe like he's, he has the vacuum state, right? Mm -hmm. And he has some other state. Whose entropies differ a little bit from the entropy of the vacuum state. Mm -hmm. And he's going to ask the question whether there is any metric for which you can interpret those changed entropies to leading order with this new metric. So, so forget about the, the vacuum state and the state with, like, I don't know, seven particles, 
uh, in NES, right? So I, I know how to compute a different metric from that because I know the metric for the seven particles, and then you know I should really uh, I should I should consider the expectation value of the stress tensor in that superposition, but I can solve for that as well. Like I can solve Einstein's equations again, and then I get a metric. That's not the but if I'm not going to include back reaction, how will I ever get an answer that's not the vacuum metric? Well, like you go the from yeah. So I think the your equation is just wrong. wrong. I mean, you, you go back one slide, but and your equation like, of this is yeah. kind of wrong. Right? This, this then I have a superposition of two metrics, which which yeah, are. I mean, it's not superposition. Just I just think the whole thing is a different state. Yeah. Right. Don't think of it as, as vacuum. Don't, yeah, don't, don't just think of the that, that is wrong. Yes. Is fine, but yeah. whose metric is maybe close to the original. That's it. It's, it's I mean, fine. The so point is that if you change, you oh, give a different. Just, just remember that first line. Yeah, yeah. forget about it. Okay, okay. It's good. then I'm happy. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not superposition, different geometry. So I'm pretty fine. Oh, yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe I should have just written a completely different state. Just, just forget about it. Forget, forget about yeah. this. Just let it slide. Just let it slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, okay. Did, you explicitly answered the, the opposite a moment ago, which is why I'm so confused. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry, I probably misunderstood the, the, your question. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, right. So here, um, <laughs> um, right. We will like to invert this random transform, and if there's a consistent metric, we will like to be able to get this metric. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the difficulty with this radon transform is that uh, if you're not going to be able to back out the metric uniquely because there's always a gauge freedom associated with the metric. It's not gauge freedom. Uh, so uh, we can look at all the solutions that people have talked about or thought about in the past. So from the radon transform side, actually this sort of uh, scenario was never fully uh, explored. Uh, so all of these uh, inverse radon transform were talked about in uh, in flat space and backgrounds, but never in a curved space background. Uh, but uh, and numerically, a lot of these just discretizes the flat space, the the flat uh, the radon transform, uh, reconstruct, reconstruction formula. Uh, so really, going into curved space, curved background, and doing uh, inverse tensor radon transform is a completely new territory for us. Um, fortunately, there are people who have explored this, uh, albeit without any rigorous mathematical uh, framework. So in the context of medical imaging, uh, they've done this, but it's still on the uh, flat space. Uh, whereas in geophysics, actually, they've done tensor, uh, inverse tensor and transform on curved backgrounds. So uh, we're, we'll borrow some of the ideas from geophysics. So I guess the geo times very well with geoflow. <laughs> Perhaps the geocast stands for that. Okay, uh, just a question, are you committing to static? Okay. Are you committing to static space time in your analysis or not? Uh, mostly static. We're, we're going to look at some civilization, but I'm not going to call them space time geometries. Okay, okay. Yeah. static. Yes, yeah. complete spatial geometry. Okay. Sure. So, um, right, so, so the connection to geophysics actually is coming from these travel time tomographies, um, their travel time, so seismic wave generated in one part of the uh, plate kind of travels through the interior of the Earth and then goes back up to the, the crust of the Earth uh, because the sound wave travels faster in the interior of the Earth. So, so here, the travel time is sort of like our geodesic uh, spatial geodesic distances. Uh, so going further into the ball kind of saves you time or saves you distance. That's why that for them there is actually sort of a curved space analog uh, understanding tensor transform. So uh, in our case, our HIJ, uh, the metric perturbation sort of corresponds to their uh, one over the anisotropy of their speed of their seismic waves. So seismic wave can have different speeds traveling in different directions depending on the crust uh, structure. So this is quite interesting. And maybe some of us can one day uh, also write a paper on Geophysics and uh, the CFT. Um, Superposition of the <laughs> Superposition of neural mental. <laughs> um, uh, but, but really, the general idea is quite straightforward. Uh, so, what, what you do is that you discretize, you discretize the boundary. So, the boundary previously is a ring, and there's a couple of field theory living on it. We can think of discretizing it, so now it becomes a spin chain that lives on a circle. Now, we also discretize the bulk. Uh, there are many different ways of discretizing it. We're going to use, uh, so this, the square tiling is the one we're going to use. Uh, 
Uh, whereas um, there's also uniform tiling that we're more familiar with. There are some other fancy tiling that you can do, depending on the data. Um, but after you fix the uh, uh, discretization of the bulk, uh, now you just uh, send a, uh, assign a tensor value to each tile. And this is, again, just three, degree, three degrees of freedom because the, uh, the tensor is symmetric. And then you plug in, you know, plug in data. <laughs> so uh, really, everything here is about discretizing this radon transform. So recall that the radon transform sort of looks like this. You can expand the integral. It, it, it just becomes uh, some very straightforward integral. Now, following my, the discretization procedure I mentioned to you, if you have some tensor field that lives on the hyperbolic plane, uh, now you just turn it into a bunch of uh, a huge vector uh, organized by the tiles that they live on. And then you can discretize the differential. You can do, uh, so this, um, and so VL now becomes the, the length of the geodesic, the segment of the geodesic that, set, that, that, in, that intersects with a bulk tile. And, and similarly, these ones are weighted by their average angle, so the angles are parametrizing the direction the tensor vector is pointing. And then you write everything down, uh, it, but really it is just a matrix multiplication. Right? So it's some giant matrix L multiplied this column vector H and is equal to B, where B is uh, the boundary, uh, boundary data. So this is organized by the different uh, geodesic ones. All right. So all we need to do is to invert, uh, invert this matrix uh, it turns out that because of the gauge freedom that we sort of mentioned in the beginning, there is non-trivial kernel associated with L. So to invert this, you really need uh, to also set the gauge constraints. So in two dimensions, there are two gauge constraints that we need to fix. Uh, these are specifically chosen because they're easy to implement. They're computationally uh, also more accurate to implement. Uh, which are just PDEs. So uh, these constraints always exist and are unique. So you can prove these. Uh, if you discretize this, now you just become another matrix multiplication that says some of the components multiply this matrix and it's equal to zero. So far, so good. Uh, so really, uh, we have turned this uh, inverse uh, integral transform problem into a matrix inversion problem with some constraint. Uh, although in practice, this uh, inversion is almost never possible. There, there is never a set of H that satisfies the equality kind of exactly because of either your data is crooked or because of discretization errors or numerical errors or various kinds of things. So instead, uh, in almost all numerical systems, we look for a minimizer. So instead of looking for exact solution, we look for best fit. Uh, subject to the constraint. And this is fairly standard optimization problem. So uh, we're, for this one, we're just going to use the constraint least squares to find the minimum. Any questions? So I'm going to show you now um, a number of examples, a number of examples we have reconstructed from various kinds of fed data that we generated. Uh, so for all of these, we're going to find the best fit solution in H star. And we're going to plot them. You can see them actually in diagrams. That's uh, perhaps surprisingly not, uh, not a Penrose diagram. They're actually something else. Uh, so all of these will be given in uh, metric components. And the reconstruction error itself is serving as a useful diagnostic. So uh, I sort of mentioned in the beginning that these random transforms are giving you a set of uh, the constraints. So what the data you have is a set of GDs. You're, you're, you're asking whether these set of data are consistent with some particular kind of geometry. Sometimes they are, sometimes, most of the time they're not. And when they're not, the less consistent they are, the, the bigger the error. So we're going to actually use this error as a diagnostic for whether things are geometric. So now we just need to feed the machine with some data. And we need a lot of data. Uh, so, quick question: the, the error is computed with respect to what, like reference? It's the it's the known geometry that you stuck in at the beginning, or like how do you measure the error? What, what is the error? 
error is this difference of between the best fit and the Oh, you reapply the, the rate on the yeah, forward. Yeah, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you, I see, I see. you forward transform the best fit, and then you see how far sorry, it is. Sorry, I All right, so uh, we, there, there are no experiments for us to generate these data, so we're going to have to take our own. Um, so uh, basically, we, we will run a number of different examples. Uh, some are physically motivated. Some are interesting to look at uh, from other, for other reasons. So uh, we'll find, really, depending on the error that you feed in, there's going to be a range of different results that you get. Uh, so for things that, are like, that look like thermal ADS, uh, you actually get very good reconstruction and probably indicates the, the, the metric you're getting back uh, or the, the state that you're plugging in is probably geometric. Uh, whereas if you look at something else like classical mixture or something that we use to simulate uh, superpositions or something that looks a little quantum like a fermion, they're way high up. So uh, that just means that your assumption is incorrect. Right? There is no consistent HIJ you can ever hope to define such that all of these equations are satisfied. So that is sort of the idea behind uh, this, this uh, procedure. Can you go back one slide? So uh, for this relative error that you're computing, um, how sure are you that this is uh, un unbiased? Like, can I, can I kind of, if, I, if, somewhere at, if someone adversarially prepared you some data mm -hmm. such that it for some detailed reason, definitely is not geometric. Mm -hmm. But like they kind of arrange its non-geometric nature to try to maximally fool this error to minimize your error. Mm -hmm. um, is there some procedure by which they can do that, or does it kind of avoid that? Basically, from the transform is avoided entirely. So, right. so it is. Unbiased. Yeah. It's unbiased. Okay. Next. Yes. Uh, the, you you already said the you uh, constrain yourself to be. Static space. That's right. And what about the dimension? Uh, two dimension. Two dimension. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. High dimension, I think. Hard dimension. Yeah. That's completely yeah. unexplored. Yeah. At least two dimensions, we know something uh, because they're just ray transforms yeah. from geophysics. Hard dimensions, nobody knows anything. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they're three dimensional. Oh, uh, they're two dimensional, but still ray transforms. So they're still uh, going along uh, geophysics, not uh, surfaces. So oh, that, that's right, the part right, we yeah. don't. Uh, apparently, mathematicians never really thought about it because it's never motivated to look at. <laughs> so I'll tell you two years ago, uh, or three years ago. So, so you have another question. Yes. How, do you know how um, what this landscape looks like? So you're trying to minimize this error, right, and go towards some global global minimum. Do you you know are there other like local minima, which means that there are other geometries that are. That are, you know, like I could describe the state pretty well using this geometry, but I, I could also alternatively describe that same state and get, you know, whole family of entropies using this different geometry. Mm -hmm. And both of those are you know, really close. Does that ever happen, or is it very clear that there's always a single, you know, this is the geometry? Not right. For the cases we looked at, it's almost, it's always this, but I think some of the things that you mentioned could, in principle, happen. Mm -hmm. um, in, in that case, it's, it's really a non-unique uh, non problem, and then you have a right. class of solutions. It's a, it's a linear problem, it's a linear problem, but it's not so it Yeah, th this one... Oh, because you're going to first order... Yeah, this one's linear, so you would never run into uh, the, right. the okay. local minimum problem, but there, but in, in, this, in this higher order is when you want to consider back changing the geodesic, because right now the background is hyperbolic, and then you consider metric perturbations on top of it. But in principle, if you go to higher order, you have nonlinear things, then it's, it's entirely possible. So here, I only discussed discuss the leading order. So then, so then it could be that even these things in the orange region, maybe, if yeah. you included higher order. Complete, yeah, completely then they possible. they could have it. Yeah, completely possible. Okay. Here, yeah, here is sort of searching through a space of, of geometries that are close to the hyperbolic geometry. Yeah, yeah, I see. But there could be something that's completely wild that we don't know mm -hmm. if it fits the data really well. Uh, so I have to warn you, all of these are from the very uh, <laughs> So first is to sort of simulate the thermal data. Uh, so you can get some uh, thermal state from a CFT, and then you compute the difference between thermal entropy and the 
and the backend entropy and plug that into the, uh, the machinery, uh, actually you will get a, a really actually quite well for a range of different temperatures, at least low enough temperature. Um, so this is as a different function of temperatures. We, uh, so as temperature decreases, uh, so the red again is the positive per metric perturbation, uh, blue is negative uh, metric perturbation. Here, by adding temperature, we at least see that if you are going into the bulk, you pick up extra length because of this thermal thing. Uh, and as you decrease the temperature, the dot shrinks, right? Which is the thing that we intuitively expect. So this is more or less a sanity check process. We're recovering some of the other things that are familiar. But we can also consider a mixture of states. Um, and the superposition of states, we also thought about uh, here, mixture of states, once you have thermal states, it's easy to do. Uh, so instead of just thinking about a single thermal state with, uh, at a particular temperature, we can think about two thermal states at different temperatures and just mix them up. So from this linearity and entropy result that uh, uh, Mary Dolan and Swingle, uh, we know that their entanglement entropy of this density matrix is approximately given by this. Plus, uh, so this is a weighted sum of the two ther thermal entropies plus a Shannon term that's the, the entropy of mixing, right? So if we look at the error again as a, pro as a uh, function of this probability, we'll see that when you when probability is zero, so you you have the one one of uh, the, the thermal states that have a well defined temperature, the error is actually quite small. So it's consistent with the geometric interpretation. Uh, but as soon as you mix in some state, the, the error shoots up quite drastically and uh, maximize somewhere around this. Uh, when there's close to maximum index, and then you come back down again when it's not mixed. It might be a stupid question, but why is it symmetric? Oh, it's because the temperature is symmetric. But we don't really oh, understand so, why it's there. So you didn't put in, so, so T1 and T2 there, are there, higher there, than T2. Yeah, one, one is higher. Yeah. But, but in this case, it's T2 higher than T2. is higher than T1, that's right. So uh, indeed, this is what we expect. Uh, so at the at the beginning, it's a lower temperature, but as soon as you go away from it, all the reconstructions are dominated by artifacts. Uh, so we, we expect it from the reconstruction error, and then eventually settles down to another uh, geometry than a uh, higher temperature. We can also talk about thermalization. Well, I have to warn you that this is not to say we're constructing space time metric, uh, rather, it is applying a spatial reconstruction to each time slice and then see what it looks like. Uh, nevertheless, the feature is sort of what we expect. So uh, if you were to apply the little quench to the entire system and let it evolve, the things thermalize, so the entropy of a region sort of grows linearly with time, and then eventually it kind of levels off when it reaches some point. Uh, so uh, if we plot the error, uh, earlier times actually it seemed to have a large error. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, whether this is physical or is actually just related to our discretization, because at the near the boundary, the error is a lot larger because of the tile. Um, nevertheless, if you look at the metrics, uh, it sort of looks like this. Right? At the beginning, uh, you have some positive perturbation, but mostly localized to the boundary, but eventually it sort of moves inward to the bulk. Uh, it sort of looks like maybe I'm throwing a, mat uh, a ring of matter into the bulk, right? it almost looks like it. So we proceed to compute the uh, curvature perturbation, and this is what it looks like. So the curvature perturbation exactly tells you that there is a ring of things. Uh, the, the light blue is some, something that I didn't expect. Uh, it's likely due to the discretization uh, errors, because the GUD is like, passing through at different angles where it has a different length passing through the red tile. So you kind of have, have to compensate that by adding some negative things in the inner in the inner shell. Uh, but in two dimensions, if you believe the Einstein's equation, it's kind of telling you that Okay, because curvature is, is only curved around here, uh, it sort of looks like there's matter just falling in, and I think eventually it settles down to the center. Okay, question. Just to double check, this was in like the Cardi Calabrese like quasi particle picture of thermalization? Um, this is actually one of the <laughs> Brian's specialty, is, I think it's. <laughs> uh, well, we just assume that formula. Yeah, we, uh, we just assume that formula because it has this, uh, it seems to have the right equality of the structure. Um, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's no tangles. Yeah. 
there's also more quantum geometry. Well, uh, I think it's not here, so we be uh, impressing another time. Uh, so, uh, so uh, there, there's the idea that maybe EGR, you know, entanglements corresponds to some sort of wormhole geometry. Uh, so we could. Uh, this is not exactly it, but. We can think about what exactly does a distantly, distantly entangled pairs correspond to in the geometric picture. Uh, so, we this is uh, data is sort of again we uh, simulated it or coped with that. Uh, so you can imagine having EPR pair and then just separate them into in the bulk uh, by some distance, and then the boundary data is just generated by it. Uh, if you use a cut through the pair, you pick up an entangled entropy. If it doesn't cut through, you don't you don't pick up an entangled entropy. Um, so this, well, ha doesn't have a very good reconstruction, sort of expected it, uh, but it has a pretty picture. So uh, the EPR, EPR pairs are sort of inserted at these white tiles over here, and then there's basically a reconstruction tells you that there is some uh, positive metric perturbations that's in between, and there's a tiny bit at the mouth. Uh, last but not least, there's also spin chain data that we can look at. Right, so we can take a C plus one half three fermion model that, that we don't expect any well defined semi classical ball tool. Plug it in and see what happens. Uh, so uh, we, we want some excited states, so we generated some excited, excited states by taking a mass deformation of three fermion Hamiltonia and taking the ground state of that as an excited state. And then this entanglement entropy for all equals are computed numerically. Then you plug it in. Alas, well, the, the error is all quite large it's on the order of one or at least 50% uh, uh, or higher, which is sort of what we expect. And if you want to look at the reconstruction, they look more or less like uh, it doesn't, it's not very telling if you're actually reconstructing the geometry is something that's completely nonsense. Uh, but then again, the error is so large, probably it's usually trusted more as um, something done geometric. So uh, as function of as time progresses, you know, kind of, we're kind of increasing the mass definition. Yes? Did you try cranking that to the large n limit or the large s limit where you expect holography to be more accurate? Uh, we need to get some data that way, so there's no way for us to interpolate between small and the large n. You could do uh, you could, g up to yeah, I n guess, equals 20 probably. Yeah, so at some point I guess uh, we buckle down. Okay, then um, uh, yeah, but at this point we haven't done. Uh, right, you can also add this order. Uh, depending on the size of this order, you still sort of a large reconstruction error. Uh, so they, again, it doesn't look anything that re resembles the geometry. So maybe it's indicative that whether it's not geometric or not. Uh, so just uh, so to summarize what we looked at so far is that we, we tried to take a first step at actually explicitly reconstructing it numerically. And in doing so, uh, we find that uh, Numerical inverse gradient transform is a, is an interesting and computationally inexpensive way of finding it. Uh, it has a good interpretation of what uh, the solution or the minimal uh, best fit solution is. Uh, it's linear, convergence is guaranteed, and then it's applicable to discrete systems like spin chains, test networks, and so on and so forth. But furthermore, we find that because we're going into this territory, we realize nature is never really black and white. There is a gradient that goes through from it takes you from something that's highly geometric to something that's highly non-geometric. And this geometry meter is sort of uh, given by the error of this, uh, the, 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 trans uh, the reconstruction, at least in some certain limits. Uh, so, so all of these were sort of the uh, tentative, or charting out some uh, unknown territories. Uh, as future work, there's a lot to be done Debugging is always in the list, uh, trying to understand what physically things mean and whether we've done everything correctly. Uh, there's also, we have to we plan to reconstruct more data as uh, you know, 
different kinds of spin chains, different sort of central charges, uh, things generated from the network or generated from geometries. Uh, but in the end, there's also interest to just progress and understand more mathematically what's the framework behind the discrete random transform on curve background uh, for, for tensor transforms. Uh, in principle, it, uh, there's quite a number of things to be done. And last but not least, there is uh, interest to, uh, to do this work in the continuous, uh, in the continuum of that by generalizing the random transform technique to curve backgrounds. So characterizing these will, uh, will allow you to uh, A, re uh, recover the reconstruction formula, and B, understand what kind of boundary data actually correspond to geometry. So this is the thing that we will be able, be able to answer in the continuous random transform. Thank you, Ben.